Previously, we had established that there exist languages that aren't regular. So in the past, we've established this. So imagine I have all my languages. So here's all the languages. So, yeah, so this is my box. All every possible language. Remember, that's just a set of strings. Are they're all in this box? So we talk. We've been studying, for example, a lot of these so-called regular languages. And these regular languages I could describe with all sorts of different computational or formal language kind of machinery. So, for example, we talked about finite automata. We talked about, say, DFAs, NFAs, epsilon NFAs. We also talked about regular expressions. We described how all of these are describing regular languages, right? But we also talked about how there's languages that aren't that aren't regular, but most certainly they are languages, right? <laughs> I can write them down, but most certainly there do not exist DFAs that can recognize these languages. And we establish these by using, for example, the pumping lemma. And we see quite a few examples of how to do that. So I want to explore another class of languages and the ones we're going to focus in on next, it's going to be what we call context-free languages. Now, you might say, Dan, how are you going to describe these things? Now, naturally, we talked about finite automata. We also talked about these in terms of, of uh, of regular expressions, like these regular languages, surely there exists other ways to describe these so-called languages, these context-free languages, which I haven't defined yet, by the way. It's going to take us a little bit of work to get there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up and use another type of way to describe a language at first, but I must stress there do exist automata for describing these types of languages, but they require a little bit more machinery to make and describe them. They need more computing power. So I wanted to use this opportunity for this lecture to talk about grammars, which are, we've, we have not touched upon yet. This is another way of describing a language. So a grammar, what, what, what are these? So I'm, I'm going to be talking about this for a bit, and then we'll define what a context-free grammar is, which naturally these describe context-free languages. So these are recursive ways of describing, describing a language. And specifically, grammars are a special kind of what we would call a string rewriting system. So it means that I'm going to start off with an initial string, and through so-called production rules, I'm going to replace the string or parts of the string based on rules. So these production rules dictate how these replacements happen. And then there's some algorithm that is used to dictate how these replacements occur and when do I finish. So a grammar is a specific way this gets processed. So we're going to talk about these. Now, you might ask, Dan, why should I care about any of this stuff? Well, for some people, they need something to tether this to when it comes to computing. Uh, these are closely, so these are closely related. To the specification, the specification or development of compilers. Specifically, I'm talking about parsers. Now, I'm not going to talk about what a parser is here, but these are used to look at the structure of a program very often. So, Let's put this all together now. So 
Before I define formally what a context-free grammar is, and I must stress that many of the concepts I'm going to talk about here are applicable for grammars, but I'm going to couch them within the discussion we're going to have about context-free grammars. So I thought it'd be a good idea, maybe I start off by trying to write out one of these context-free grammars. So, so here is a context free grammar. And I'm going to give it a name, I'll call it G1. So you might ask, what are, what are we going to be talking about? So I'm going to write out what the, a description of its production rules, and then I'll tell you some terminology associated with it. Hopefully that sounds great. Uh, so let's, uh, I think that usually is a good way to get into this. So I'm going to have a production rule for which we would refer to what's sitting on the left hand side before the arrow as the head of the production rule. And then of course, so this is the production symbol. Then I have a body for the production, which consists of another string. So this is what we call the body of the production rule. So this whole thing is a production rule. And in here, we're going to have a combination of different types of symbols. So we're going to have things we're going to call variables or non-terminals, such as this variable here. Notice that this, this is a, this is a, so this is a variable or non-terminal. And then I notice I have these symbols here. These symbols are examples of what we call terminals. So you could think of these in terms of our discussions in the past when we talked about automata as like input symbols. So strings that consist of these uh, of these uh, these terminals, they're gonna have a they're the ones that we're really interested in. So we're going to be play, applying these production rules to end up with a string that consists of these terminals at the end. So, so these two right here, like the one and the zero, these are examples of terminals. So think of these like input symbols. So think input symbols. In that similar vein, you can think of variables like states. But I, it's not really the greatest way of thinking about it, but it's, a, it's, it's one thing that you can do. But it's just, it's another concept. So let me write out a few more of these production rules. So remember, here's another one. Uh, let's suppose that, uh, that we have this one here. Suppose I have it where the head of the production rule is P. So notice it's the same, same variable it's being used here. Then I have Q, which is another variable. So you might ask, Dan, what does this mean? It means that whenever you see a P, you can apply this rule to replace that P with a, with a Q. But let's introduce another rule. Let's say Q and say it's a two. So in this case, the two is a terminal. So if you're wondering how this works, the idea will be that I would start off at some with some symbol, and that will be what we refer to as the start symbol. So say, for example, we presume, so let's presume P is the start symbol. So that's what the initial string will look like. It's just going to look like a P. And what will happen is I'm going to apply these production rules to mutate P so that the goal at the end of this is that the string only consists of terminals. So the way that is done is I apply these production rules so that I try to replace the variables with terminals eventually. So I'm allowed to keep applying these production rules to replace parts of the string with other parts of the string recursively. 
So that's the string replacement part I'm referring to. So before we get into that, I just want to reemphasize a few things. So just a reminder. So I've decided, decided that P is the start symbol. In these grammars, you always have a start symbol that you have. It's always, there's always one of these variables that is associated as the start symbol. So that's the initial string you would imagine you have, and then you start mutating it by applying these rules. So for example, if I applied this one, I would start off with P, then I would replace P with one P zero. So that's the new string I would get, as just as an example here. So, so the variables in this case, so they're P and Q, and we have terminals. Terminals are 0, 1, and 2. So you might ask, Dan, how exactly are we generating a string using the grammar? So I'm going to describe the language. So any one string that you were to generate as a result of this grammar as follows. So here's, you know how I talked about there's an algorithm that you apply to generate strings from this grammar? So that's, this is the algorithm aspect of it. So the grammar describes a language by generating, by generating each string as follows. So, as I mentioned to you, the first thing you do is you, you begin with the start symbol. So begin with the start symbol. So you just write that down. So first you start off with the start symbol. So how I use this grammar is I would start off with P. So that's the start symbol. So I'm going to do this by just walking you through this process. Once I've, but I want to make sure I describe this first too, and then I'm going to give you some terminology for how we're going to do that, okay? Because I know I'm laying a lot of things on all at once, so I just got to be careful when I do this for you, because the main things, as long as you understand that the goal is that we're going to have it where you're going to eventually take the start sampling, you're going to end up with a string of terminals, then you're in a good place at this stage. Is everybody, is that clear to everybody? Is so every time I'm just going to replace the parts of the string depending on these rules. So for example, I could reapply this rule to this string once I have this string. And I could keep repeatedly doing that. But the process has to end at some point when I'm describing this grammar, right? So I have to apply I have to eventually get to where I have a string which is terminals. So so what you do is you find a variable that is written that is written in the body in the body of its production rule and then what you do is you just simply replace the variable Replace the variable with the body of the production of the production for that variable. So remember, there can be several, as you can see in this example, there's more than one of them. I could pick any one of them if I wanted to uh, for that variable. So we'll see some examples in a moment. And then there's step three. You might say, Dan, what's step three? <laughs> All I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat. So we're going to repeatedly repeatedly apply apply to step two as long as there are variables.
So I stop this process once, this, once I just have a, a string of terminals. Now you might ask Dan, how exactly does this work? So I've given you the overview of the process. So you start off with the start symbol. And the idea is that you can apply a rule to that variable. So if a variable appears in that string, you can apply its respective production rule to it to replace it with a different string. So for example, if I have p here, I can apply this first production rule here. And I can replace p with 1, p, 0, like this. So notice that I took p, I applied this, then that, I just replaced it with the body of this production rule. Now, you might say, Dan, what can I do with this? <laughs> well, notice that I have a p inside. So notice I have p right here. p is a variable, right? So what I do is I can look at my production rules. So and now I'm at step two. I find a variable that is written in the body of, a, of its production rule, replace the variable with the body of a production rule for that variable. So now, notice I have two different production rules here. I have two different ones. I could apply this one again, and what I would do is I would replace p with 1p0 again, but now it will be 1, 1p0, 0, 0, right? <laughs> Or I could apply the second one there. Let's apply the second one just to see what happens. So I look at the variable. I have a variable right here. I'm going to apply the production rule here. So now 1p0 now is going to be, I'm going to replace p with q because that second production rule there says I could do that. 1q0. But now you'll notice that I have now a variable that is a q. Well, notice I have a production rule for q, and tells me I can replace q with 2. So now I end up with 1, 2, 0. So you'll notice that now the string doesn't have any variables in it anymore. It has, it, it, it's just terminals. So do I stop this process now? Or do I have to do anything else? Is there anything else I have to do? <laughs> no, there's nothing else. We're done. Yeah, we're done. Exactly. We're done. So notice that now I just have one, two, zero. This is an example of a string that is generated by this grammar. So do you notice how I could have gotten a different string by applying the production rules differently? So the big overarching idea of what the language of a grammar, or what the, the grammar is going to describe, is going to be all possible strings that are generated by these applying these production rules such that I end up with a string. And that string has to have only terminals. The terminal string, or what we'll refer to as a sentence sometimes, I'll usually refer to as a terminal string, or just a string as a result of it containing terminals, all of those terminal strings that you get as a result of applying these production rules, that is the language of that grammar. So I'll, that's how I'm going to be get, working my way to. So I want to be able to tell you what this, what I just did here is. So I'm going to talk about the concept of the derivation. So, so to describe, to describe how a string is generated, is generated, so this is the how, is generated, we perform a series or sequence of substitutions. each called a derivation. There's the word for you. Derivation. To obtain the string. To obtain a string. And I must stress that the derivation doesn't have to, it doesn't have to yield a string that only consists of terminals. You could stop it at any one point in this. It's just the problem is, is that 
that you may not be describing a string that's generated by the grammar at the end, right? You're just somewhere in the middle of this process. So we're going to very often use this this uh, this this right arrow to indicate a derivation. So let's do another one just so that you can see. So I'm just going to put a box around this because this is important for you to be aware of. We're going to use this term very often. So this idea of a derivation, or we could say something a little bit more technical, which I'm going to define in a moment. So let's do one more just so that actually let's do let's do two. So for example, since P is a start symbol, I didn't necessarily have to use this one here. I could have instead have used this production rule, right? So just as an example, I could have went P, then I could substitute that for, so I could do a substitution. I just changed P to Q. So now I replaced P with Q because that's the body of this production rule. And now notice I have a Q. I replace that with, by applying the third production rule. And now I end up with the string that just consists of two. So there's another example. And one thing I really want you to notice is that you could, and I'll, okay, I'll, I'll do one more example, because it's fun. This one, this one, if I keep using this one, you end up starting getting some more complicated looking strings. So, uh, let me, let's, uh, I'm just trying to think, because I've kind of filled up the board here. I'm just going to get rid of this diagram. And we'll do it up here. I'm just laying it all on you. Like the mayonnaise on a good sandwich. <laughs> so here's another example. So start off with a start symbol. I'm going to do, do another, uh, I'm going to apply one of these rules. So notice that I have P. I'm going to replace it with one P zero. Now notice I have a P present in here. I'm going to replace P now by using the first uh, the first rule again. So now I have one, one, p zero zero. So notice that I replace this as so. So notice the part I've underlined here. That's the part that that's changing. So specifically, I've changed the p here for that. So now notice I can actually keep doing this. So so I could replace the p again. One one. So I'm, I'm going to replace this. 1p0, 0, 0, 0, and this is what I get as a result. And then I could simply apply the second production rule. 1, 1, 1, q, 0, 0, 0. And then I replace, using the third rule here, I replace the q by 1, 1, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0. So do you see how I can use these production rules? So I would say that this derives that via this production rule. So let me give you a definition to kind of lay out this whole derivation process. So one way I could describe this process is using, say, this arrow notation like this. I'll show you another way in a moment. So, so we write u derives v, u derives v, which this is denoted as follows. So it's denoted by u, where I use the same right arrow. So I'm going to use this right arrow like this whenever I make one step. If I want to make multiple steps, I'm going to have it where I'm going to put a little asterisk on top. They went like, oh, and then some. <laughs> so, so instead of just one step, I may apply several steps. This is a, another way of describing, and then there's several steps. Because this is just saying, oh, if I could go from this string to that string via the production rules, then that means that there's a, ser a sequence or series of production rules I can apply to get from U to V where u and v are strings. 
if either u equals v, meaning they're the exact same string, or there is a sequence, there is a sequence u1, u2, all the way up to uk for some k or equal to 0, where Or if I apply a production rule, I get u1 from u. Then I end up with u2 by applying a production rule, and so on. And suppose I get to uk, and then I end up with v. So there's got to be a sequence of production rules that get me from u to v. Now, you might ask, Dan, what are these things in between here? What are they called? I'll usually just refer to them as the strings or the derivations. However, uh, there, is, there is actually technical phrases for what the string looks like in between these, if sometimes it's helpful to have that. So as a remark, any string a derivable, meaning that you could go from the start symbol, derivable, derivable from the start symbol, start symbol. So suppose you start at the process, suppose that, for example, u is the start symbol. If I could apply any sequence of production rules, meaning that means it's derivable because it took me some production rules to get to that string from the start symbol is called a, this is the fun word of the day, it's a potential form. It's called a potential form. Think sentence, but made fancy. <laughs> potential form. So each one of these is a potential form, if you start from the start symbol. That's at least how we're going to use it. The definition can be used in much more broader context. So, you might ask, well, what, what is it when you just have term, a terminal string? So, you might ask, Dan, why is it called this? Well, let's see. Where, where, a string of this kind is called a sentence, <laughs> a sentence. I told you there was gonna all come together. Called a sentence when it only consists of terminals. So this is what I refer to as a terminal string earlier. Pretty interesting stuff, right? So now we have a way to talk about this process of applying the production rules. And also we could talk about what each one of these individual strings are. So these are all sentential forms. And when I end up with a string that only consists of terminals as a result of this process, any one of them I would can refer to as a sentence or terminal string. Is that clear, everybody? So I'll very often talk about it in terms of derivation or derives, as opposed to using this terminology. However, you're more than welcome to. It makes it easy enough to describe whenever you want to talk about the thing that it becomes. <laughs> so that's one way you could describe this process. Another common way of describing this process of applying the production rules is graphical. It's visual. And now I'm going to show you a graphical way of talking about a derivation. A graphical way to represent a derivation is using a parse tree.
which is constructed as follows. As follows at any stage of a derivation. I must stress that the root does not need to be the start symbol. When I apply this derivation process, you just think of it as I take a string, I can transform it into another string via these production rules. So typically we're interested in when it's the start symbol, which is why I defined it the way I did over there. But I must stress that the way you could graphically represent a derivation via a parse tree doesn't require this. So one, all internal nodes, so remember these are ones that have at least one child in the tree. All internal nodes are labeled by a variable. And each leaf node, each leaf is either a variable terminal or epsilon oh, our friend the empty string you can tell right away that the uh, that epsilon isn't a terminal symbol <laughs> it's not a terminal akin to what our discussion like I said should remind you of input symbols what's left what's left well now I got to talk about what happens at the internal nodes So of course, the internal nodes are labeled by a variable, right? And the leaf nodes can be a variable, a terminal, or epsilon, the empty string. So this is the more interesting part of this. If an internal node is a variable, A, and its children, its children are labeled are labeled x1, x2, all the way up to xk. And there is a production rule A, which produces x1, x2, all the way up to xk, where 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 each xi is a terminal is a terminal or variable. Where, I must stress that I need to address epsilon, where xi is epsilon only when, only when it is the only child. It's the only child. What do I mean by this? The production rule will look something like, will look like this where I have a variable, production symbol, epsilon. So now when you, when, you, uh, when you talk about what these parse trees are representing in the context of the root being a start symbol, so, so I'll show you an example in a moment. So starting, Starting from the root being the start symbol, being the start symbol, the yield, the yield, kind of think of like crops, this is the, the fruit of my labor, okay, the yield, the yield of a parse tree.
the yield of a parse tree is a terminal string a terminal string from the leaves of the parse tree namely this is when you concatenate that together left to right left to right when all the leaves are either terminals or epsilon the empty string when all the leaves are either terminals terminals or the empty string. So let me do an example, because this is a lot of stuff to lay out. If, you're, if, if your brain isn't wired for visualizing everything as, a, as some sort of tree, I'm not talking about the trees that go up like this, thinking trees like this. Um, this is a lot to take in at once, so let's see an example. So the, I, can, I must stress the parse tree can describe any part of the derivation process, but I'm interested in the yield of a parse tree. So I thought I would show us how this would look step by step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this derivation process. So I'm going to re write out that derivation process. So this is actually the last example we did where I had the p and then I then I replaced this with 1p0 and then I replaced so then I substituted this p part so I did a derivation via the production rule over there, the first one. And then I could go 1, 1, P, 1. Sorry, not 1. It should be 0, 0. And then I did it again, right? So I got 1, 1, 1, P, 0, 0, 0. So I have three ones, three zeros, and I replaced. So just to actually speed this up, actually, now I'll show you each step. So I'll have 1, 1, 1, Q, right? I used the second production rule in that example. And then lastly, I replaced the Q with a 2, right? Right? That was the example we did earlier. That was, the exam that was one of the examples that we could have gotten from the context-free grammar, this one, by applying the production rules. So you might say, Dan, what the heck is a parse tree? So let me first start this off. So I imagine I have the root. I'm going to use the start symbol P just so I could put this all into our context of how we're going to use these things or at least how you might use these things. So suppose that at, I start off with that. So technically this is a parse tree, but it doesn't, it doesn't yield anything, right? Because there's no terminals as the leaves has to be that all the leaf nodes are terminals. So you might ask Dan, what are you going to do next? So I applied, I applied this production rule, right? So I applied that one over there to end up with this. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to write, draw it out like this because it's really helpful to, to see where the terminals are. But I must stress that normally when you're just drawing these out, you might not know in advance how deep the tree will be. This is meant for us to see this a little more easily, how this works. So I'm going to apply the first production rule. So I'm going to have a 1, P, and then I would have 0. So do you notice that if you look at the leaves from left to right, you'll notice that it looks like this, right? <laughs> Does everybody see that? So now, I'm going to do it again. So now I'm going to apply the first production rule again. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply it again. So I'm going to substitute, I'm going to change this P to be 1P0. So then I end up with 1, 1P0. So 1P0. So now if you read off the, the leaves, do you see that I'm looking at any one of the sequential forms, right? 
Now, let's let's do it again. <laughs> so, so do you notice how I'm every time I go down, I'm applying each level of this tree as I'm going downward. It's just me showing you how I'm doing the derivation. Does everybody see that? So, let's do it again. 1 p 0. Now, let's apply the second production rule. Notice that, and remember, notice that this is actually just me describing the third step to you every time I'm doing this, right? The third part is just saying if I have an internal node that's a variable, I look at one of the production rules. I have children for each one of the terminals or variables that appear, right? Then what happens is I just keep doing this process, uh, and it's just like I'm doing this up here. So now I'm just going to replace the P with Q. Notice that, again, you could read off the leaves. You can see at any one step of this process that I'm carrying out, you have a parse tree. Just the thing is, I'm interested in when it yields a string, right? <laughs> I want to know what its yield is. I want the fruit of my labor, OK? So let's let's see what happens. So now I'm going to apply the third production rule and add with two. Notice that now all the leaf nodes are terminals or epsilon, the empty string. Obviously, if it's an empty string, it's just there's no symbols, right? You'd still read it left to right. But now notice you end up with the terminal string or sentence. That's exactly the one right here. And just to emphasize some of the notation that we've been using, where I said u derives v. You can skip several steps in this top process. So for example, I could have just simply written P with the star here, and I could go 1, 1, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, just to bring it all into a nice bow. So you'll notice that I could start up here, and eventually I can end up where the leaf nodes will look like this terminal string. So this parse tree yields this string. So it's another way of me describing what I've generated as the string as a byproduct of the, using the production rules. Is that clear, everyone? So this is the graphical way you could talk about these derivation rules. And sometimes this visualization is rather helpful to think about it as a tree, because trees have nice properties. And computer scientists really, like a lot of them, usually really like it when you, you get a form that has a tree-like property like this, because then you can talk about the leaf nodes, the internal nodes, and you can ask questions about what happens with the tree when particular assumptions are in play. So some remarks. So some remarks I want to make is, you know, in our first example, we had it where we had the start symbol was P, but I had two production rules that are associated with P. This is actually a very natural way of thinking about a grammar, is that, is that we can think, we can think of production rules belonging to its head. So you know how I talked about the head of a production rule, which is a variable in our case. So when we have multiple, when we have multiple production rules for a variable, For a variable, i.e., suppose I give you p and the body is alpha 1, and suppose I have another one where it's variables p, it's a production symbol, then alpha 2 is the body of its production rule, and suppose I have another all the way up until I have p, where it maybe has an nth product body of a production rule. We can abbreviate. We can abbreviate for simplicity these rules. Uh, 
those rules as, and I want to stress that you'd read the bar that I'm going to use as or. Because, you know when I had multiple production rules with the same variable as its head? What happened was, is that we've got a choice of the one we're allowed to pick. Did you notice that? As I, I could have picked either the first one or the second one to start with. So, when I lay them out using these vertical bars, it's deliberately done so that you can think of it as or. So you could pick this one or that one. So you'll see what I mean here. So you you can rewrite this out. Instead of having a bunch of P's with those down like this, it's very common to write it like this. P, production symbol, alpha 1, bar, or or, alpha 2, or, alpha 3, or, all the way up to alpha N. So just as an example, as an example, I'm going to revisit our example G1. <laughs> the context-free grammar G1 can be written as follows. So, you know how I had three production rules I had written down, right? So I had P, and then I had, the first one was 1, P, 0, right? And then I had immediately below here, I had P produces Q, right? So if I follow this, right, I should be able to do this. So 1P0 or Q. And then I had Q that produces the 2. So I could replace Q with 2. This is a little bit more compact. This example that I had here is rather small grammar, so it didn't make a big dent. But I think that it's actually really helpful when it's written like this because it makes it a little easier for me to actually see what the language of this grammar might be based on the things we've described up to this point. So I want to know, I want to know, what is the language of this context-free grammar? Now remember, I haven't defined that formally for you, but I've given you already the idea for how it would work. Are there any suggestions of what the language of this context-free grammar would be? So remember, this is just all the possible strings that could be generated from the start symbol by applying these production rules. So we've seen some examples, right? We've seen how we can get just a two, right? Then we can get it where we had one, two, zero. And then I had it where I could have one, one, two, zero, zero, right? Then I can have one, 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 two, zero, 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 right? So I had three ones, two, three zeros. Do you see how I can keep repeatedly applying this production rule right here to keep making longer and longer strings as I desire? But what's the form of those strings? Could somebody tell me? So what are they going to look like? So just a reminder, what I just said here is that strings that I can get, and we've seen these in our examples that we did earlier. We had one, Sorry, I had two, and then I was able to get one, two, zero, like this. I could also get one, one, two, zero, zero, right? That, I, I didn't give you this one's derivation, but most certainly you can see how you could do it. Then we, then we came up with this one, right? Do you see what's happening? What's happening with this grammar? <laughs> what's happening? So if I were to keep using this, seems like that is the driver of how you get more strings. Why? Because notice that it's using a variable in one of its production rules, and it doesn't immediately lead you right to a terminal. Well, if you look at it, notice that I could just keep applying, I could keep substituting on this rule. So what would be the language? Uh, 
So what's its language? Well, it should be that you have you have 1 to the n, 2, 0 to the n, where n is greater or equal to 0. Now, I haven't proven that to you, but you can see quite quickly, based on the simplicity of this grammar, that it probably is indeed the case, right? But I want a real question. Let's be some real things here. Something down to earth and real, based on the discussions we've had in the past. Is that a regular language? Nah, it's not regular. This is not regular. This language is not regular. So what I've done for you just now with this example, so with our example, we were successfully able to describe a language that isn't regular, but I've given you actually a mechanism to describe it. So a formal way of being able to describe it that isn't just simply, oh yeah, here's a language. It's not regular, right? Now I have actually given you a process to generate strings like that of that given language. And that means that context-free grammars are capable of describing languages that are not regular. So now we can define what a context-free grammar is. Now that we have a good feel for how grammars work and what context-free means and some of the main terminology we're going to need for this. I like to do it this way so that we have a little bit of fun playing around with the concept before we get formal. Because we've never talked about what a grammar is, and it's likely you've never seen what a grammar is up to this point. If you did, hopefully you had a good time. So it's going to be a four tuple. G. It's going to have four parts. V, T, P, S. Where 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 v you might guess from the way i've laid out these based on the terminology we've used that v is a non empty finite set of variables of variables these are sometimes called non-terminals, just to be clear. Called non-terminals, as opposed to terminals. Akin to something we've seen with uh, regular expressions, you're going to think of these variables like the represent. An intuition behind them is you can think of the variable like it's representing a language. Akin to how we use variables in a regular expression in the past. Each variable represents a language. That's at least an intuitive way you can look at this, most certainly. Is that the variable itself, remember, because we can apply production rules on that variable, we can end up with a bunch of different kinds of strings, right? We can have a whole bunch of different strings depending on how we apply production rules to that variable. So you can imagine that if I want to talk about the language of the context-free grammar, I want you to put this in the back, back behind your ear and think about what the variable would be that describes the language of the context-free grammar then. So just think about that. Just put it behind your ear. We'll come to it in a moment. So what T is, because it starts with a T, it is the terminals. A finite set of terminal symbols or terminals. If it makes it easier to remember, think terminal as terminate. Finish, right? The end. Your destination. The place you go when you want to have some fun. <laughs> I'm just kidding around now. Terminals. These are the symbols that form 
non-empty strings non-empty strings in the language. So I must stress that in the way the grammar is defined for context-free grammar, note that V and T are disjoint. That means they have no elements in common at all. They're pairwise, they, 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 there's no way there's any elements that are common amongst the two. are disjoint, are disjoint, and the empty string is not a terminal symbol. So epsilon is not a terminal symbol or not a terminal. Akin to what we talk about with input symbols. Epsilon is not an input symbol. Okay, next. P, naturally, is, this, is a finite set of production rules. where each rule has a variable has a variable and a string s of 0 or or more variables and or terminals. That's what we referred to as the body. So for those that are technically inclined, this string would be the union of S, sorry, of V and T star. So because you could take zero or more variables or terminals. Then finally, what do you think S might be? S is the start symbol. Some people call it the start variable. So it's one of the variables. Is the start symbol. This is where we all begin in this process. So let's do an example. I think it's a good idea you see how I could pick up this notation and use it. So some people would, if you want to be a bit more explicit about how you define the grammar, you would use this, you can use the for tuple. And then you describe the production rules. Sometimes it's easy enough to just get away with just describing the production rules. If you already have some late, laid out rules like we have in the past where we normally use terminals, as lowercase letters or num or just numbers, and then we had variables as uppercase letters. This eraser's giving me a hard time. <laughs> Let's do an example. So consider context-free grammar GP. So we're going to use this GP in a little bit quite more intimately. So I'm going to define it here and then we'll come back to it a little bit in a moment. We're going to define it as follows. So remember it has variables, right? We have the four tuple. We've got variables, terminals, production rules, start symbol. So this one's just going to have one variable and then it's going to be over 0, 1. We're going to have the production rules, and then we're going to use A, the variable A, as the start symbol. Then we have to define the production rules. Where the production rules, P, R, are given below. So 
Here's my, here are the production rules. So I'm going to tie them all together, associating them with variable A. There's going to be 0, A, 0, or 1, A, 1, or 1, or 0, or empty string. Now, looking at this, can you tell me some strings that this grammar is capable of generating? So this is a really neat one. It's fairly simple to describe like this. But there, what, what is this, this describe? Well, let's think about it. Let's try using some derivations. So let's do some derivations. So I could start off with uh, A. I can apply, say for example, any one of the three over here, right? So I can end up with one. I could, for example, end up with this sentence here. I could be that I end up with just the empty string. But what else happens? What else happens? Well, let's see what happens if I try using these first two rules over here. Let's see what happens. I want to see if I go through applying these derivation rules, what kind of string I get at the end. So let's apply the first one here, 0, A, 0. I'm going to apply production rule for this variable a here. And now I end up with, well, suppose let's use this other one here. We get 0, 1, a, 1, 0. Let's apply now the first one again. 0, 1, 0, a, 0, 1, 0. Now let's apply, um, let's apply the empty string. Let's apply that, that rule right there. So I should end up with 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. That's the resulting sentence that I have, the terminal string. Is there anything interesting about the string that we got over here? What's going on over here? We've talked about these types of strings in the past. Do you notice that every time I apply either this rule or that rule, I introduce a symbol on both sides. If you imagine it like this is the middle, it introduced a new symbol onto the left side and the right side, but in the same positions that are closest to the variable. If it helps, imagine it like I'm putting my hand into the water and you imagine the ripples coming out. Every time I do and make a splash or a wave, it's like applying one of the first one or the second one. But notice it happens in both directions. Well, what does that mean then? Well, look at it. If I read it this way, it's the same as if I read it that way. We had a name for these. This one just has, happens to have an even length, but I could have easily picked one or zero there instead and just put it in the middle. This is a palindrome, right? It's a palindrome. So this example here, that's actually, I'm not going to prove it here, but we're going to prove very shortly um, in a little bit get you excited for this. We're going to prove that this context-free grammar is capable, and in fact it does, describe the set of all binary palindromatic strings. And we already know that from our previous lectures that that, was, that, that language, it's not regular, right? So, So 
indeed, we, uh, now I want to describe to you what the language of a context-free grammar is. So we'll come back to this palindrome in our discussions. So if, if I'm given a, a, a context-free grammar of this form, is this context-free grammar, then the language of G, which is denoted as L of G, akin to our other notation, is the set of terminal strings or sentences set of terminal strings that have derivations from the start symbol. In plain language, this is simply the language for which we talk about the set of strings that that grammar generates. So formally, you'd write it like this. It's going to be the W is among T star such that S derives W, where S is the start symbol. And you might ask, Dan, what is a context-free language now? So one way you can define the context-free language is as follows. So what's a context-free language? If L is a language, and there is, there is a context-free grammar, G, so that L is equal to L of G, then L is context-free. And that's the definition of a context-free language, which I'll often abbreviate as CFL. I'm not thinking of football or anything like that. So that's what a context-free language is. This is the language of a context-free grammar. If we never need to prove that a context-free grammar indeed describes a given language, i.e. it's correct, you would use this def This is definition's your best friend. And whenever, now one of the main things we'll be interested in are describing these so-called context-free languages.